Good morning to you all, and uh, especially good morning to you, Jorgos Lantimos. Welcome to Gothenburg. A big hand for Jorgos. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Hinek Palas, and I will be moderating this discussion. And uh, I do hope you all have questions for Mr. Lantimos, um, of any kind. Mr. Lantimos is here with his latest film, Alps. Uh, a couple of years ago, he had the film Dog Tooth which uh, were showed in Swedish theatres last year. So please, any questions, just put up your hand and you'll get a mic and intervene whenever. Uh, my first question to you is, how did you start in film? Why did, it, why did you start doing films? Um, I don't know if you ever know the reason uh, of these things. I definitely didn't know it from a very young age. Uh, I mean, you you weren't really allowed <laughs> to to say seriously that I'm going to be a filmmaker. I mean, at least uh, where I come from, and you know, most parents and families uh, have you know an idea about their children that they're going to be doctors or lawyers. I guess it's that in many countries around the world. So um, I started by saying I want to go into marketing and <laughs> you know to commercials, so it, it, it seemed like a more respectable and contemporary kind of living. Um, but as soon as I finished school and uh, I, I went into the Greek university to study marketing, <laughs> which is something that I have no idea about, um, I realized that I have no interest in that and I just uh, accepted that what I wanted to do really is uh, make films because I loved them from a very young age. So I just it just had to be a process of uh, accepting it and actually making it. So I, I stopped going to the university to study finance and marketing and all this kind of stuff and joined the film school. And there you have it. Thank you. Um, but you've also been filming in the field of dance and theatre, if I understand correctly, before you started to make feature films. Um, how, how has that affected what you are interested in, in films, in the films you make? Uh, it, it was less a choice, I have to say. I mean, it's how life guides you. <laughs> um, I mean, making films, especially in Greece, was very difficult. So I could, I, whatever chance I would, find, uh, I would find to film something, I would take it, so I was acquainted with some choreographers uh, or dance theater uh, directors uh, and I started shooting some of their performances and then started making uh, small uh, videos of that were made specifically for, for filming. Uh, so I, I started having a relation to dance somehow. Um, so I guess that helped me understanding uh, the physicality of things much more and it's something that I like very much and I don't know if that's why I mostly work that way with the actors, more physically instead of intellectually or theoretically. Uh, but that's a truth and uh, th this whole experience helped me a lot. And of course I had to do for many years commercials and that's where I basically uh, learned the technical aspect of filmmaking, which also helped me a lot. Um, uh, because the, sc the school that we have in Greece, it's like we don't have a proper national film school. We only have a, uh, a private film school, which doesn't have uh, much of uh, technical support or theoretical support. So. Uh, the only thing that you can find there is other people who are interested in, in filmmaking. So you make friends, and with them you make films, and try and learn more things, and search and research. Uh, and that's how we proceed. You said you work with, I'm interested, you said you work with the actors um, more physically than intellectually. How do you work with the actors? I mean, physically and not intellectually. Sorry. Well, a main thing is that uh, I try not to get into analyzing uh, the script or the parts or motivation or past or present or uh, I, we don't get into such discussions. And if someone tries to, I try to avoid it. Um, 
and then I just, we just do things, uh, physically, you know, do things, do things, challenge them to uh, go to rehearsals and just try this and try that without explaining why and why something feels interesting or why something uh, feels complex completely silly, or if, or if it feels completely silly, for some reason maybe it fits uh, what we're trying to do. So we just try things and do things without asking why, without intellectualizing it. Uh, and little by little this, this is formed by someone that's watching it from the outside, obviously. And uh, yeah, that's how we do it. How did you come up with the technique? I know, I know you are very influenced by Bresson and Casabetes, or those are directors that you admire. Yeah, they are, but their their styles are completely different and opposite. So, um, I, I didn't. I don't know. It was just by experience, basically. Uh, I also worked in. I directed a couple of plays in the theater before making my first film, and that helped me a lot. I had the time. Uh, that was required to explore and investigate how you could achieve what you wanted to achieve. Uh, of course, theater is quite different, but uh, still you get to spend a lot of time with the actors and the people and uh, try and find the ways that you can come to the, uh, to the desired uh, outcome with them. So uh, without having any theatrical background or experience, I directed a play and that gave me a lot of experience in working with the actors. Are you a comfortable actor yourself? Because we've seen you in the, in the, in the part in Attenberg. I couldn't say <laughs> it's ever comfortable. <laughs> I, I wasn't too tense uh, and uh, to tell you the truth, I was quite bored. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but you know, it's a it's a it's a very different experience, and I guess it depends, you know, in its set and in its situation. I guess it's different. If I was making an action movie, maybe I wasn't going to be that bored. But maybe not. But because you uh, you wait a lot of time until they fix all the effects and things, and so you wait around a lot on a set. So that was kind of boring for me if I didn't have to do all this stuff that you do when you're directing a film that when you don't even have a a minute to you know to breathe. <laughs> uh, so, it, you know, it felt boring, but it was a rewarding experience in the end. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're going to watch a clip from Alps now, the latest movie. And... <laughs> That was half a clip. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. I, I, was, I, I don't want to ruin, you know, the, the, for the people who haven't seen the film. Uh, do, do you mind telling us a bit about uh, the concept, what what Alps is about, and where where the idea came from? Uh, yeah, it it's uh, it, it started from a discussion we were having with a writer, Ephthimus Filippou, that we wrote this script with, and uh, we also wrote Dog Tooth together. So we were trying to figure out what. Uh, our next film was going to be. Uh, and uh, he said something about, uh, I think about people who, write, uh, who, who ask from other people uh, to write to them letters, uh, but pretending to be a friend of theirs or a lover or someone from their family that had died, so they can somehow still keep in contact with them. And you know, it it felt like it it would touch very interesting subject matters, but it, it didn't. I mean, it, there wasn't a story, and it didn't feel cinematic. But I kept thinking about it, and at some point, uh, I just wrote this synopsis about uh, this nurse who works in a hospital, and there she finds people that have just lost uh, someone, one of their closest uh, people has died. Uh, and she offers to actually uh, stand in for this person or substitute him in, in their daily routines, act physically, you know, really pretend to be that person instead of calling on, or writing letters. Or, um, 
Yeah, and you know, we discussed it and we found it quite interesting and quite complex and sad and funny and ridiculous and you know, it would lead us to uh, things that we were interested in. So we started writing the script. And the, con the name, the Alps, that idea of mountains that cannot be replaced or can be replaced, how did, uh, where did that come from? Well, if you let the clip play, <laughs> you would <laughs> have seen. <laughs> um, it's... Uh, I think we followed a similar process like they followed. Uh, we were trying to find a name for this group that was uh, offering this service, uh, and it had to be a secret group, so it didn't, it shouldn't, you know, reveal the name shouldn't reveal much about their uh, activities. Uh, we always want things to be funny as well, <laughs> so uh, it 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 seemed like a weird logic, but would would that would actually make sense what he says and how he. Uh, justifies choosing that name uh, for the group and then you have the chance to also use the mountain names for the people that are in the group so they individually can be called you know Mont Blanc or Monte Rosa or whatever so it, it felt like it just uh, fitted our uh, what we wanted to do and it was quite ridiculous and funny at the same time do you think it's a service that is needed in our society today Oh, I don't know. Uh, that's I guess that's what the film is exploring, or not if the service is needed, but uh, you know what kind of things do we need? Uh, what kind of things do we need to cope with death? What I what kind of things do people that actually offer this service or a similar kind of service need? Because I think in the end we. We we followed much more the people that were actually offering the service and uh, pretending to be the dead people than the deceased people instead of dealing with the uh, the grief and problems of the families or friends that have l had lost this person. So I think our interest our interest was more on why and how and where does it lead uh, this person that actually goes and pretends to be someone else for someone. Uh, what are his motives, you know, how far he can go, I mean, why does he do it? I mean, obviously there are financial reasons, but uh, all the other reasons seem to be much more important. Uh, so, yeah, that's why we, I guess the main character in the film is the character of the nurse. Who do you think copes with moving on the best way in the film? <laughs> I don't <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know if anyone copes, and uh, that's. I think that's what I just said. I mean, I don't know. I don't think we really uh, were concentrated on on that, on the people that cope with death, but uh, on people that cope with life. So, how do you see this film in relation to Dogtooth? As someone, the Swedish director, said to me this morning in the breakfast room that he he saw it as a follow up to Dogtooth, and I was like, what? Well, <laughs> so how do you how do you see it in relation to? Well, to I don't know exactly what follow up means, but uh, I, I mean as a film. I mean, if you make another film, it's a follow up to the previous one. So, uh, <laughs> it, um, uh, what what I see, and it's basically also what I want to see, but many people see other things, is that. Uh, and I realized that after having finished the film, that this film is basically uh, uh, exactly the opposite journey of the main character than it was in Dogtooth. I mean, in Dogtooth it was this girl that was trying to escape and uh, break free from this condition and situation and uh, jail and, uh, I mean, this place. Uh, and in this film there's this person who's trying to uh, break into a house to... Uh, feel that she belongs somewhere, break into relationships, uh, force herself on on things. So it's, and funnily enough, it's the same actress as well that plays both women, and it's exactly, uh, to me, it's exactly the opposite uh, journey. So, you know, other people say that it has similarities because there's also this group who feels like a family, 
so definitely there are similarities and there's similarities in tone. Uh, although I, I think you know this film might you know be uh, sometimes darker, but sometimes funnier than than Dog Tooth. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's a follow up <laughs> in many different ways. <laughs> Do we have any questions about Alps or anything else? Speak up. <laughs> Good, we're done. <laughs> oh, here we have one on the second. <laughs> How do you work with the cinematography in your films? Um, the cinematography, I always leave it for last. Uh, I really don't know how we're going to shoot a film. Uh, uh, until we write the script, find the actors, find the locations. Um, th there's also many practical issues. Uh, we, we make our films with very little or no money at all. So uh, every time you have to incorporate that in the way that you want to shoot the film. So with this film we basically had nothing. <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to be also having made dog tooth which uh kind of looked more you know beautiful in a way and bright and colorful i i wanted to and i felt that that was appropriate for that film for the contradiction it it, it provided for the subject matter i felt that this film should feel uh dirtier and darker somehow uh being based also on the the, lo the locations that we had because we d we couldn't really choose locations or we couldn't really have props to make them up and uh, improve them or make them worse or whatever i mean we couldn't really do anything so we had you know these locations we had no lights <laughs> we had this one camera so uh and what we tried to do is you know, not hide the conditions and the situation that we were working in. And I thought this whole situation and condition that we faced b because of making a film in Greece under these conditions should be somehow reflected in the film. So we let everything really bear. So that's a, that was a major decision. And so when I met with the DOP, I said, OK, we have no lights. <laughs> we have this camera and these lenses. and." You know, we have to do what we're going to do with this. Um, the other thing is I, I, I really wanted to break the very strict and specific uh, style that Dogtooth had. Obviously, you know, there is a lot of it in there because it's me and, you know, I, I, I like things in a certain way. But I also always try, try to break that in many moments, and I th felt that that was more appropriate for this film because, you know, it, it involved many more characters, many more locations, so I felt that uh, this, you know, pattern and this uh, stylization should, you know, be broken many times, and there would be scenes that you didn't expect to see them this way. Um, and another thing is that because we, we shot this film digitally, we could actually uh, make many more takes uh, and you know ma make many different shots. So that kind of influenced the style in a way. We could shoot a, a scene in different ways and then exactly because I wanted to break this very specific style of filming, so then in the editing I was able to to simplify this process, because the process was very it was much more complicated than it was in Dogtooth, for instance. I mean, we would shoot many different things in many different ways, but uh, what I had in mind was not to use all these things, but be able then to select what felt right for each scene, and from a very complicated coverage of a scene, be able to produce this very simple uh, scene, you know, with only a couple of shots still, but the truth is that this time we shot many more things. And actually, uh, we, we also shot many more scenes that weren't in the script necessarily. Uh, so every time we would, we would finish early, we would just uh, come up with more scenes that weren't in, in the script. We would uh, improvise, or many times, if uh, the script, the script writer was there, 
and you know we would write something very fast and we would do it and so that that kind of process dictates a lot of the style of the film as well We have another question back there. Before the microphone reaches him, I just want to know what was the budget for Alps? <laughs> it hasn't yet been confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> and no, that's true because uh, we shot the film for like 90,000 euros. That's all we could get at the point, at that moment. So we decided to start shooting. And I have to say I was very scared, but Thanks to Athena, who produced the film with me. She's also a director, and we help each other, you know, produce our films. Um, you know, we had 90,000. Of course, it wasn't enough. Of course, most of the people wouldn't get paid, but most of them were friends and people that we've been working before exactly the same way. Um, so we could take uh, this decision and actually go ahead and start making the film with this kind of money hoping that on the way we would be able to get more money and if the film was somehow successful, got into a major film festival, if we you know, got an award, then thankfully all these things happened. So the film was accepted in competition in Venice, we got the screenplay award, so money started coming in. Uh, so now I am proud to say that we have paid everyone. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, but I don't know exactly how much the, the budget has been now. But I guess if you actually, uh, if we actually thought from the beginning that we would pay all these people, it would be like you know five hundred thousand or something like that. If we had the money to to actually make it properly. The question back there. Uh, yeah, you kind of uh, covered <laughs> most of it, but. Um, <laughs> One thing with the uh, with the improvised scenes, did, uh, did a lot of them end up in the finished film? Uh, not a lot, I have to say. We were pretty unsuccessful with that. <laughs> no, actually, the thing is that um, many of the scenes that were also scripted didn't end up in the film uh, because you know th th it was a, a more complicated film with many more characters and many more. Um, uh, storylines, let's say, uh, different people. So we had written more <laughs> than necessary. So we had written more than necessary, and then we saw even more. So it, it was a, you know, like a four-hour film in, in the beginning. So we needed to cut many things out. Um, so many of the scenes that were also scripted uh, didn't end up in the film. And I, I really can't remember anymore, but yeah, definitely one of or two scenes uh, that we improvised are in the film, but I really can't remember which is which at the, at the time. Do we have any other questions at the moment? If not, we'll uh, screen another clip. A whole clip or? <laughs> another short clip. I don't want to ruin the film for them. Oh. It's from the dog too. Θέλετε να ακούσουμε τον παππού σας να τραγουδάει. Ναι! Uh, the, the years since Dogtooth came, uh, I saw it in Toronto, so it's a couple of years ago, and everyone I've talked to since then have, I think, their own interpretation of the film. Uh, and you must have had hundreds of interpretations. Have, have you, are you surprised about the way the film has been, recep the reception of the film and the success of it? Um... I wasn't surprised about their interpretations. I was surprised uh, about the success of the film. Um, I, I felt that this was going to be, you know, a small little Greek film that, you know, very few people would see. Uh, so, you know, it just was too much uh, at one point for us. Uh, but, of course, you're happy about it. Uh, the thing is that, you know, you don't know what it is that you did <laughs> that, you know, uh, made the film be so successful, so you can not really repeat it. Um, and I don't think we really want to repeat uh, ourselves in, in that way. Um, 
So yes, but we always try to make our films quite open, so they're you know people can you know think whatever they want about them. Uh, we just want to present you know a condition, a situation, explore characters, and make them do things that we, we feel they're relevant to what we're exploring, and then it's up to the the viewer to start you know thinking about these situations be engaged hopefully with a film actively and not just passively you know watching a film that says okay this is like this and this is what happened and this is what you think about this situation i mean it's i always try to avoid that and you know leave things open and in the end people can have their own minds and opinions about uh, what's going on in the film so uh, yeah i'm really happy that people receive it dif differently. Sometimes people see too much into the film. Sometimes, you know, they can't really make anything out of it. I mean, it's... Uh, but you can't control that if, you, uh, if you're making uh, this kind of film. How was it received in Greece? I mean, did people interpret it in relationship to the, to the dictatorship in history or...? What French was... people interpret it <laughs> in relationship to the dictatorship. Greek, Greek people, I think, saw it more like as it was, and that's what that was our initial uh, intention. I mean, we never said that we're going to make an allegory of something or dictatorship or whatever. Uh, so I think it's easier for people outside, you know, the country that the film comes from, to make more associations and uh, explain more things, uh, different things uh, about the film than. Uh, Greek people. Greek people received it quite well, b mainly because it was a huge thing for Greece, getting you know an award in Cannes after like 15, 17 years or whatever, and uh, and in the end even getting a nomination for an Oscar, which was like 33 years or whatever. So it it was a it was a huge um, thing for Greek society in general. They they treated it as a you know, phenomenon and whatever, and it was in the newspapers and TV and everything. Um, you know, it was crazy, uh, the whole thing about Doctor. But the truth is that most of the people that went to see it wouldn't really go and see such a film, but because all these things happened, um, um, people went and saw the film, and the, the reactions, of course, were mixed. I mean, People loved it or hated it, uh, so. But that's what you expect from this kind of film. You have said uh, in interviews that the idea for Dog Dog Two for you made it because you saw your friends getting married and having children. Can you can you elaborate a bit on that on the idea of family or post family? Yeah, it was interesting to me that to see people that I knew for many years getting married and having children. Um, many of them having said that we're never gonna get married or have children. Uh, and then when I, you know, made fun uh, about it, I, you know, I started teasing them about, so why are you doing this? You know, this is never gonna last. Don't you see all, all families, uh, you know, they don't last for long, you know, everyone is getting divorced, children end up fucked up, you know, why are you doing this? And I saw them getting, you know, really, really defensive about it. They, they had no humor about it at all. <laughs> they, they were like, oh, why are you saying this? And uh, what do you mean? And so I, I just started thinking that, you know, how far people that you even knew and <laughs> uh, were kind of different before, uh, how, how far people could go to actually protect their families. And, uh, you know, if you messed with that, I mean, uh, you know, find a situation that would, you know, show the extremes of, of that. Uh, and also there's a f another funny thing a friend of mine said when I said that, you know, I think there should be no more families. I mean, we should find a, a different way of progressing in society. And he said, yeah, I think it's the end of the one liter Coke bottle. So the, I, that, that, you know, I found it funny, you know, that they were, there wouldn't be any... Uh, Coca-Cola bottles produced in one liter and it would be just the small ones because there would be no families. And <laughs> yeah, that idea, that idea started me thinking about, okay, if there were no more families, you know, then maybe there would be this, you know, these parents that, you know, have 
kept their family away from the rest of the world as a secret. And you know, it, it was all, always, almost like a science fiction idea in the beginning. Stephen King. <laughs> Whatever. But, um, uh, of course, then it, it started being about uh, you know, the results that such a situation would have on the children and on the people there. So uh, we concentrated on that more. Do we have any questions? Talk to anything? Well, I'm curious of the topic. You, the, the 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 videos that they smuggle into the house or that end up in the house. Uh, why the particular movies? You, why why did you choose these movies? It's mm, uh, Jaws and Rocky and Flashdance and I mean these are movies that we grew up with. We loved. We've watched like many times. Uh, so, you know, why not? Out of love, I guess. Uh, and uh, again, they also uh, gave us, you know, many funny, interesting moments of, you know, coping scenes from from these films and the way that they um, interacted with these people that had never seen films before. Uh, well, this one person that actually saw them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it it was a fond memory of ours, uh, and obviously our films don't really resemble these films, but somehow we have a very soft spot in our uh, spot in our hearts for them, uh, and looking back at that, it also seems very funny, so um, that's why. What films would you like to have smuggled to yourself? What are your own favorite favorite free films? Well, I would be much more intellectual about it. <laughs> no, that's stupid. But uh, I would definitely want to have, I mean, if what you're saying, the necessary films, I would definitely have a lot of Woody Allen films. I mean, I, I just find that there are the films, especially the, you know, the period in the 70s, his films, I just can watch them anytime. If someone says, you know, let's go and see Hannah and her sister, I say, yeah, why not? I mean, even if I had seen it the day before. Uh, so, although I state that my favorite, you know, filmmakers are Bresson and Casavetis and Buñuel, and their films as well, I would see anytime. Uh, but Woody Allen has something um, which is funny and moving at the same time. Um, and you know, it's very direct somehow, and I, you know, I feel a warmth somehow watching his films. So now you just told us that the budget for the latest movie in Greece was ninety thousand euros. Well, how is the situation in Greece for filmmakers at the moment? Yeah, you can guess if the budget for a film. Is <laughs> um, it's bad, but it's it's always been almost this way. I mean, there was never proper funding for films in Greece. Uh, there was always the Greek Film Center, which did and it did not really work. Uh, and there were very specific people that would get money from the state and the Greek Film Center, because Greek films are basically government funded. Uh, because mainly there are no, uh, there, there was no, there, they, we have just voted you know, a new law and structure about filmmaking, which, of course, still hasn't hasn't really been active. Uh, but we just changed that. But before that, there wasn't really any incentives for private funding to go into films. Uh, there were no tax incentives or anything. So that people didn't really have reason that we weren't, you know, supporting culture in somehow. Um, they, they didn't really have a reason to, to put money into films. And, uh, you know, it was all government funded and it was very uh, particular where the money went. Uh, so younger people couldn't really make films. So at some point, you know, we just started making them on our own. Very, very small budgets, you know, friends working together, people helping each other just to be able to make films. Mm -hmm. And that's how, how it was. And that's how I made Kineta. Uh, we just made it on our own, produced it ourselves. And then, because Kineta went to you know Toronto and Berlin and uh, got some international recognition, then we 
we did get funding for dog tooth which was like 250,000 it was 200,000 funding and 50,000 from a pro, uh, production company that would, I was making commercials with and even that that you get the funding doesn't mean that you actually get the money uh, so we had to actually shoot the film without the money and wait for a couple of years till we all the money uh, was returned to the production company that Uh, produced the film so you know the crisis then didn't really change much I mean it, it was a similar situation only this time you knew that uh, maybe the the funding that you got from the Greek Fel film center maybe you wouldn't you would never get it you wouldn't even have to wait for the two years so uh, we we just uh, you know like I told you we just decided that we're gonna go ahead and make the film and we'll figure out later what happens. And uh, thankfully, the, the film did well, and we did get funding, not money. This is two different words. <laughs> we did get funding from the Greek Film Center after the, the film was finished, after it went to Venice. Mm. And the money are still coming. <laughs> <laughs> so your next film, will you make it in Greece, or will you... you, you You li you're not living in Greece at the moment. Will you shoot somewhere else, or what? What's your plan? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm not. Stu I'm not sure. Um, I I'm developing some some projects in the UK, and it might be there. But um, I like. You know, I always wanted to work in other countries, in other languages, you know, other cultures. So um, at this point, I'm developing projects there. I don't know which of them is going to happen first and if it's going to happen there, maybe uh, if the opportunity arises and you, you have the, you know, the chance to go to another country and make a film there, uh, it's going to be that. But yeah, after having made three films in Greece the way we made them, you know, it just feels natural and logic if you have the chance to make a film with a bit of better conditions you know, you should take that chance. And uh, which doesn't mean that I don't want to go back to Greece and make another film there because, you know, wherever you make a film, I think it's kind of unique if you allow the whole situation and condition and um, culture and people, uh, if you allow all these things to be part of the film, it's very important and it makes the film quite unique. Uh, and that's why, you know, I we took up the chance and made the films the way we made them in Greece. Uh, I mean, Alps, we could have shot it, you know, after the success of Dog we, we could have gone to another country and make it. But we decided did stubbornly that, you know, we want to make another Greek film, uh, no matter, you know, how difficult it would be. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, we should do things in in a different way as well. Yes, we have a question. I'm just uh, curious, uh, did you move from Greece um, uh, because of the conditions in, in this, uh, in, in your foreign country? Uh, I mean, the society and the economy and... Uh um, n no, that wasn't the reason. I always aimed to be to at some point go to another country and make films there make films in the english language uh but of course uh, the situation just helps you make the decision faster and uh, feel that you know you you really don't have much to lose if you go and try and make a film in another country uh so it wasn't the reason definitely i was planning to do something like that even before uh But you know, it it just feels more justified when you do it at this at this point. Do we have other questions? Oh yeah, okay, I can't see him. Okay. So please, we have a lot of film students in here and directors. You must have questions here for one of the most interesting directors in the world at the moment. I mean, come on. I just interested in. Uh, If you could say something about Angelopoulos, he died now, or he was the accident, and what his films, and so if, I mean, in Greece, and yeah. also about something about that, I would 
interests me. Um, I, I can't really say much about uh, Angelopoulos. I mean, uh, I, I knew his early films and I liked them a lot. Uh, I didn't follow his latest films that much. Um, yeah, it, it's sad. A man died. Uh, I think, you know, uh, people in, in Greece and in general, I think, tend to uh, glorify someone after his death. Uh, while, I mean, I think that in Greece, he wasn't as respected as outside his country. And I find that kind of weird, the whole uh, thing. When he died, you know, everyone's writing these glorifying words about him and the great master that died and all these things while, you know, while he was alive. And it, I mean, it wasn't that uh, complimentary, the whole thing. Uh, that's uh, a thing that I can say about it. But, you know, I didn't really know the man. I had met him once. You know, I appreciated his films and it's sad that he died. Um, yeah, I, I just, you know, and people say it's tragic or not or whatever. I, I mean, it's tragic when somebody dies, but uh, I think the way he died, it was better than, you know, getting sick and because he was like 77 years old. Uh, he had a full career, full life, you know, all kinds of success in the world. So, um, well, it's better to die making a film or being out in the street instead of dying in a hospital bed, I think. And uh, so that's all I can say about it. We have one up here and one, well, <laughs> two. And then one. Hello. All of a sudden. Uh, I, I wondered, uh, since you said that you had uh, this main character in Dogtooth, and then in Alps you you made uh, uh, her kind of the opposite or the other extreme. Will you move on to another subject matter, topic matter, totally now in your new film? Or, or is it like a subject that you keep coming back to as a filmmaker and that you want to explore and explore? Well, I, I don't think the subject is so similar anyway. I mean, Alps and Dogtooth. Um, I think uh, the way we think about things with a theme is that we've written these last two films together um, mm. is quite particular. I mean, we're interested in finding those ideas and situations that really test and explore human behavior. Uh, and that's something that we like, that, that arises from conditions that might be extreme. It's like, I think it's, we're like, like making experiments, like being in this lab and, uh, you know, uh, putting all these people in these situations and see what comes up out of that and, you know, what will explode or not. And uh, so I think we have this way of working, but... Um, I, I'm, I'd like to do very different films as well, so I, that's why I'm also uh, looking at adapting books or uh, reading other people's screenplays. So I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to always expand and uh, do different things. We had two questions up here in the front. I'm curious um, how, how you work together with the, with the screenwriter. Can you say something about that? Do you write together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, with Ephthemis, uh, it's, it's a lot of discussions in the beginning of, uh, to find what we're looking for. I mean, it's different. I mean, Dogtooth, I had the idea, and uh, I went to him with it, and he had never written a script before. Uh, so I told him the idea, and he was interested. Uh, and we started... Uh, by writing scenes, I think, uh, I told him the idea, I told him a couple of examples of what I, how I thought these people would be, what would they be doing, and he would go and write like two or three scenes to see if, first of all, because he hadn't written a script before and he felt, I think he felt quite um, uh, uneasy about it and he didn't know if he could actually do it. Uh, so he, he started writing a few scenes and we would look at the scenes and we would go, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that's maybe not, I mean, uh, we don't really care about this part of this subject. Uh, 
and then you know I would suggest more scenes, but he would he would do the most of the writing. I mean, he's the writer. Um, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I think we didn't work in a conventional way, like uh, doing a, a structure of the whole story of the film and then writing scenes about it. But we mostly started by writing scenes uh, separately. Uh, and then it would evolve in a bigger script. Um, we, we thought about it very uh, logically which is kind of weird for that kind of film, but because the situation wasn't that common, we just tried to be able, uh, we just tried to to start thinking about, you know, normally if these people were doing this, what would they do? I mean, I remember thinking about the, the idea with the aeroplanes, uh, that they see, uh, you know, uh, the only thing that they can see are aeroplanes in the sky, so how do we explain that? So I was trying to find a way to explain the aeroplanes in the sky. You know, and I said, okay, so why don't they tell them something stupid, that they're games and they would throw the aeroplanes in the garden, the small aeroplanes, and they would tell them, ah, oh, the aeroplane fall from the sky. So uh, basically it was very logical. You know, find uh, all the solutions to the problems that these parents uh, would have. Uh, make uh, trying to achieve what they were trying to achieve. So yeah, and after we had uh, many scenes, we tried to have a structure in the film. Uh, and an ending which actually came in the end. So, you know, after having written Dogtooth, the next time was kind of easier. I mean, we knew uh, our way around uh, working together. So. And even the idea this time, we just sat together and said, okay, what do we do after a dog tooth? I mean, we want to make another film, so what should we write about? Uh, and I explained to you how that came about. He said something, I said something, and you know, we, we find something that we feel good about, and we start again writing scenes. Actually, this time, no, uh, I mean, no, Alps was uh, very similar, we wrote uh, scenes and then we structured them, um, uh, but now the the script we're writing now uh, to do it uh, in the UK, uh, we had to do it in a different way because I mean uh, practicality gets a lot into all of these things be because we have to get funding for development. So once you get into a proper way of making films and not do whatever comes to your head. Uh, you have to have a special formula, so which we always mess up a little bit because this time we, we needed to do like a treatment for what we were writing and a synopsis and all these kind of things to deliver them for funding. Uh, director statement, I, I'm never going to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so this time uh, we thought of the idea, we discussed the idea, and uh, we started writing a synopsis that would be interrupted by scenes. Uh, so what we've come up with now is what we call scriptment, which is part script, part treatment. Uh, so there were paragraphs that would describe the situation, and then the, a scene would follow with dialogue and everything, and then just a description of the rest of the story after that scene, and then maybe again uh, describing you know the situation. So it's like uh, this Frankenstein document, uh, but which I think says a lot more about the film instead of a director saying, "With this film, I want to explore the uh, human mind." In the <laughs> so uh, so it's my. I think it's much more specific. I hope other people think so too, because <laughs> we're not going to be getting any money. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, it evolves and it becomes different. I tried to supervise a script in the UK, which was a completely diff different experience because you don't have the same relationship uh, with the other person. I mean, you don't know him as well. So it turns out to be very different, uh, like awkward, I would say sometimes, because if you haven't really uh, chosen the, the writer for what he is and what he delivers, it's, I find it hard 
to make him write something the way you want him to make. And then you end up in conversations like, okay, tell me how I should write it. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Then I, I should write it. Or, so uh, it's, it's, I think it's different with every person. You had a question, right? Not anymore. <laughs> what? What? what not, uh, where are we on time? Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, I was also going to ask about um, how you work together with the screenwriter. Um, but Think maybe you could. Yeah. <laughs> 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 maybe you could say something about how long the process for um, writing the screenplay for Dog Tooth and. Yeah. Amps. It, again, it was very different. For Dogtooth, um, it, it took us like two years, but it was not just because we were working for two years. Uh, it was because we have to to have jobs, to earn a living. So uh, Ephthemis is working in an advertising agency, and I was making commercials as well. So we would meet once a week you know, between working in commercials, and we would follow that process like, okay, here are some new scenes and what do we think and here are some new ideas and then we would go away and then a week later, maybe during the weekend, he would have written a couple of new scenes, I would have thought of a couple of new things and uh, it would evolve like that. And of course, it was our first script, it was his first script, so it took a lot of time for it to form. Uh, but on the, on the second, on Alps, uh, it was a much faster process, uh, uh, also because he quit his job, <laughs> uh, so he was more available. And uh, but also we, you know, we knew each other much better, and we could work faster. So uh, once the idea came, um, I remember us, and it, it's funny because he he writes very fast. I mean, we when we get the idea, uh, then. <laughs> I annoy him for a week, like, when, when are you going to write and what are you doing now and whatever. And he says, oh, I can't, I don't want to. And then, you know, uh, in a weekend he just writes half the script. <laughs> and then we discuss it and then of course we change it and maybe, you know, we keep a few things in there. Um, but this time we went, uh, we spent like a week uh, together in a house uh, and uh, we came up with the characters for Alps and some of the storylines. Uh, so it was like a, a week for that. And then, you know, he wrote uh, for a couple of months. And we, were, we would meet again more frequently uh, th than in Dogtooth. Uh, so it took like, you know, six months, I would say, the script of Alps or something like that. So it was a quite a faster. Uh, process, but now he got his job back because he doesn't have any money. So <laughs> <laughs> the next one is going to be. Uh, we have even time longer. for one last question over there by the pillar. Yeah, in uh, in Alps, you often uh, decide to leave the camera uh, behind the character. Uh, how do you uh, decide when to do that and when not to do it? Um, I guess it's instinctive, somehow, uh, and. Uh, also dictated again by the physicality of things, of how people interact and how the location is uh, and what kind of information you get by being behind the person or in front of the person. Um, I generally didn't want to be the camera to be too imposing on this film. So many times I wanted to be kind of behind or on the side or in a little corner you know, observing these people. Uh, so whenever we could do that, we, we would follow that if, you, if we got enough information just by being there. There were other times, and also because of practical reasons, that you couldn't, you know, place the camera in a proper position so that would, you would get enough information for the scene in a simple way. Uh, and instead of trying and have too many shots and make too many cuts uh, in the scene, then you would have to place the camera in a different uh, spot so that you would get uh, as much information possible from 
uh, I guess that's a philosophy. You know, try to place a camera uh, somewhere where you get most of the information from there, so you don't need to uh, have too many shots and be too explanatory and expositional about the scene. So fi to find that spot and then uh, do another couple of shots if that's necessary uh, for, for, for each scene. Okay. Uh, is it 11 o'clock now? Or should yes. we, uh, and we have to stop. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, audience.